Okay, so thank you very much. I'm Ken Edwards, the Sustainability Officer for the City of Delray Beach. Tonight, we'll hear from professionals in the development industry that have guided thousands of projects to green building certification using the Florida Green Building Coalition and the National Green Building Standard Systems. The first part of the meeting, we will have two pres presentations uh, that describe the systems, processes, and costs of green building certification. Later for the panel, we'll also be joined by executive level representatives from FGBC and NGBS. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers and representatives. First of all, we have with us CJ Davila. He's the executive director for the Florida Green Building Coalition, FGBC. He's a sustainability and resiliency professional with a passion for improving the built environment in Florida. CJ oversees the development and implementation of this green building certification program, which is designed specifically for the condi conditions in Florida. FGBC is widely used with more than 27,000 certified projects in Florida. We also have Cindy Wasser, Senior Manager of Green Building Programs at Home Innovation Research Labs. This is the entity that implements the National Green Building Standard, NGBS. Uh, leading building certification for residential construction. She provides strategic support to NGBS, leading development of features and tools utilized by verifiers and developers. Cindy's done consulting work supporting implementation of EPA's labeling programs such as Energy Star, Indoor Air Plus, and WaterSense, and provided sustainability technical assistance to the National Association of Counties. Uh, Cindy and CJ will be joining for the panel during the QA session. Drew Smith is Chief Operating Officer for Two Trails Sustainable Building Consultants. Drew will be given the second presentation and I'll do a little intro for him at that time. Our first presentation is Dr. Jennifer Langwell, Founder and President of Trifecta Construction Solutions. She's worked to integrate green building principles and sustainable design for more than 20 years. Her work includes creation of award-winning high-rise, multifamily, and single-family residential projects, commercial projects, and some of the largest and most sustainable land developments in the world. She's also a consultant to governments and municipalities moving towards sustainable operations and management practices. Jennifer has certified over 5 million square feet of buildings and 30,000 acres of land developments using programs from FGBC, Green Globes, and LEED. She's a past President and Vice President and a certifying agent of the FGBC, a National Association of Home Builders Verifier. She's a certified green professional and a LEED accredited professional. Uh, Dr. Langwell and Trifecta has received numerous awards, including in 2011, when she became the first person that is a two-time recipient of the National Association of Home Builders Green Advocate of the Year Award. So I'm really glad to introduce to you, Dr. Jennifer Langwell. And I thank you for that. I will tell you, I do put my pants on one leg at a time like everyone else. So <laughs> despite all of that, um, we, we are just normal people that do normal things. So I'm gonna go ahead and share, if that's all right, this presentation and get this going. Let's see. And so hopefully, Do you see a full screen of presentation? Yeah, we do. All right, perfect. So as you mentioned, right, some of our, our challenges here to talk and discuss the cost of green building as well as the difficulty of obtaining certification. And so I'm going to start out talking about FGBC. I know Drew is going to talk about NGBS. And I can tell you when most people start moving into this arena of green building, it, it's not user friendly, right? We're, we're absolutely inundated with all of these different certification programs that mean some of the same things and some of different things. Um, so it's not necessarily, like I said, the most user friendly route to go down. Within Florida, really the, the foremost dominant programs that you'll see with respect to vertical construction are going to be the lead program from the USGBC, Green Globes from GBI, the Florida Green Building Coalition, and the NGBS. So those are really the four programs 
that you'll run into and or I would say are used most often in Florida. I mentioned lead simply because it's the, I'll call it the Coke of colas or the Kleenex of facial tissues. It's a brand that everyone recognizes. Um, unfortunately, everyone assumes that these other programs like FGBC and NGBS are as out of touch, I think is the, a, a good word to use sometimes with lead. Um, they don't always uh, incorporate field uh, items into their certification process. And so the only reason I mention this is because a lot of people are frustrated by the USGBC program or it stresses them out or they have a bad experience and they, the assumption is that all programs are the same and that's not a correct assumption. So yes, do all of these organizations have third party reviewers and formal boards and committees. Yes, that structure is very similar for all of these programs. Um, but again, don't be intimidated because one of them you weren't a fan of, so to speak. Um, what was mentioned earlier is that one of the key advantages to FGBC is that it is Florida specific. So as great as the national programs are, the majority of the country is heating dominated and we are cooling dominated. So we do things very differently here. So the Florida program really looks at addressing that. It also looks at affordability um, and also durability because we have so many natural disasters. Once you get into these programs, you'll find they all have similar categories, meaning they're all going to look at energy. They're all going to look at water. They're all going to look at your site in some way, shape or form, health and indoor air quality materials. Um, and again, Florida has a separate category for durability, which is unique to the Florida program. Florida has four levels of certification, which all the other programs do as well. We're bronze, silver, gold and platinum. Some other groups use slightly different names, but again, it's a tiered progression as you do more items to make the house or multifamily project more resource efficient. All right, so from a prerequisite standpoint, uh, FGBC tried to keep them very minimal, meaning we have three prerequisites. One is if you have a pool, uh, meaning you have to do something. So it's, it's possibly a pool cover, it's possibly a saltwater system, um, it's possibly using alternative fuel to try and, and run your pumps. So you have to do something if you have a pool. If you are on a natural body of water, you also have to do something, and that is to protect the natural body of water, which pretty much every zoning code out there is going to require you do. And of course, we have no uh, Category 1 exotics. And so when we look at energy in Florida, right, our biggest chunk is, is cooling, right? Heating and cooling is roughly 42%. As far south as, as we are, um, you know, you're looking at maybe 2% is attributed to heating. Hot water is a good chunk. Appliances are a good chunk. Lighting is there. Um, this little 7% piece is new. It's uh, what we call plug loads. So if you think, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have all the widgets. And now I'm sitting here with a PC laptop, a Mac, a double screen, an iPad, a Mac laptop. Um, and all of these things in my phone are, are plugged in. So we've just really increased what we're doing from a, a plug load standpoint. And so what we want to do is we want to really address that heating and cooling load. And when we look at buildings, we have three systems. We have the, the non-energized systems or the building envelopes. So the doors, the windows, um, the walls, the insulation. We have the energized systems, which are all your MEP, your HVAC, your lighting, your water heating. And then we have what I would call my favorite piece or my favorite system, which is this human element. And I call this one the most challenging because, you know, it's a 4th of July barbecue and we want to keep our sliding glass doors open and we want our house to still be 75 degrees while we're air conditioning the entire state of Florida. So we we are the challenging piece in this green building uh, system. The Envelope and the mechanical systems are easy, I would say. 
When we talk about energy, so as a builder, what you guys usually are looking for is the piece of paper you need to get your permit, which is the piece of paper you see here that has the word pass on it. Um, and normally your HVAC guy might be providing this to you. You may have your, your green building person is also capable of providing this to you. So this is what you guys look for. And what goes into this is all of those things I mentioned, the building envelope and the mechanical systems. That tells you how well your house performs. And so at the end of the green building process, we like to get a confirmed HERS score, which is a home energy rating system. And that basically tells us the mile per gallon or how well or efficient the house is. When we get down to zero on this HERS scale, we're, we are what is called a zero energy home. If you look at houses from the last boom, so to speak, you know, we were in the, the 100 to 110 range from a HERS score, and right now code sits around a 70. So, you know, we're, we're at 70 from a standpoint of code, zero is a zero energy home. And what we find is a lot of houses that just build well are in the 50s and 60s. And when I say build well, I mean caulk, gaskets, simple, inexpensive things. Can you bump up to things like spray foam insulation? Absolutely. Do you have to? No. Do you need to add radiant barriers? Not necessarily. Do you need to do pressure injected foam? No. But all of these things will absolutely help with the building envelope. Equipment, Energy Star appliances, smart controls, all of these again help impact that energy performance. From a water standpoint, most of our water goes to irrigation. Now, if you have reclaimed water, that's great. If you're on potable, it's kind of a scary nightmare. But um, other than that, it's showers and baths and laundry. So kind of typical use. And as you know, out there, there are low flow fixtures that are available, same cost as regular fixtures. Um, I always hear the, well, the low flow toilets don't work. Um, and so what we, we have to talk about there is what's called a MAP score. And this is a, an ASTM test of how well the toilet performs. And the higher that number, the better it goes up to a thousand. And I can walk into any home improvement store right now and get a low flow or dual flush 1000 MAP rated toilet for $99. So again, it's not that you're gonna sacrifice performance or that you're going to have additional cost. Using drought tolerant vegetation, again, most municipalities are really pushing towards that. Using micro irrigation wherever possible is definitely a huge saver or advanced controls on irrigation. So things like soil moisture sensors, weather-based controls, we're seeing a lot now of, of internet or web enabled sensors so that I'm sitting in my house, it's raining, my sprinklers go on, which they shouldn't, and I can go ahead and turn them off right from my home, my phone. So again, it's a convenience thing. And then, as I mentioned, Florida addresses all of these durability issues in their programs. We also look at indoor environmental quality and then materials, as do the other programs. We really do focus in a lot on durability, though, because we feel if you build it and it lasts over the lifetime, you're going to save more resources overall. To do the FGBC process, so all of the stuff I just told you are things that you would consider as you're going into this process. But you would start by basically looking at your floor plan, looking at your energy calcs and gathering what are your standard features? What's what's your base build, so to speak? And you would engage someone who is called a certifying agent. A certifying agent has been trained by FGBC and what the certifying agent is going to give you is a preliminary score. And what we find is that a lot of houses right out of the chute are either within a few points of certifiable or are already in the certifiable category. Because again, as I mentioned, different municipalities are requiring drought tolerant vegetation. You know, Miami-Dade requires uh, low flow fixtures. So there are requirements out there that are already pushing you towards this goal, so to speak. The certifying agents, again, have to have some building experience. They have been trained. They've passed a course. Um, you can find a list at the FGBC website. If you are at all savvy with Excel, 
Um, you can go again to the FGBC website, download a checklist. You will find tabs at the bottom of the checklist, which go through each of the categories. And even if you aren't interested in certification, just from a value add standpoint, looking at some of these items and going, you know, hey, the, I really should be doing that. That's a best management practice. It's not a cost thing, but it's a great thing from a, a marketing perspective or a value add perspective. So the checklist is available. In addition, we have what we call complementary programs. So if you also opt to do Energy Star, you're going to get points for that in the FGBC program. If you do Water Star, if you do Florida Friendly Landscape, you'll get points for that. If you do the Fortified program, which I happen to love, it's an Insurance Institute program, it gives you lower insurance rates. And so that, again, is something that you can immediately provide to a potential home buyer as an advantage. So you will receive points for those within our program um, because if you pursue them, you're doing good things. The second step is really the inspections and the updates. So depending on what points you're choosing to target really dictates whether or not you need a, an initial inspection, um, which would be around that foundation time. The second inspection, which is absolutely required is pre-drywall. Um, so your certifying agent will get boots on the ground. They'll do an inspection. They have to see what's behind the walls before drywall goes up because that's confirming that you've done many of the points you've claimed. And then the final inspection at the very end of the project. We also much enjoy or, or really encourage you to have a confirmed HER score, which is a blower door test. This is beyond just your envelope test, which is required for code. Um, it's a little bit more um, intensive, so to speak, but you do end up with that confirmed HER score, a certificate of it, so you know exactly how the house is going to perform. Um, in addition, through this whole process, your certifying agent is working with you, looking at submittals or things that you're, you're considering purchasing and helping guide you through the process. Um, on the website, again, the official documents, I mentioned the checklist, the reference guide gives you detail. Um, if you want additional detail, it's also contained within the checklist if you uh, roll your mouse over the different credits. And then from a cost perspective, the fees going to the organization um, are anywhere from $75 to $125. That's for single family home. And then multifamily uh, varies by quantity of buildings and quantity of units. Um, there are member discounts. So, and our membership fees are, are very low. So I would mention that, that that's ideal to become a member and take advantage of those savings. And uh, what you end up with are usually these two items. You end up with that confirmed HER score telling the homeowner exactly how their house performs and you end up with your green building certification. Um, everyone always asks, right? How much does this cost? How much do I have to add to the cost of my house? And th the answer to that is really, it depends where you're starting. So if you're building an absolute code minimum house, are you going to have some, some expenses? Probably. Are they going to be more than $5,000? Probably not. But a lot of people are you know, already putting in slightly better items, whether it's better insulation or decent windows or um, different fixtures. So again, I really encourage you to look and see where you land as you're currently building because you may be very close to start. And so I'll stop there and we'll get this turned over to Drew um, to talk about the NGBS program. Drew Smith is the Chief Operating Officer for Two Trails Sustainable Building Consultants. He's a state of Florida general contractor been in sustainable building for over 18 years and construction for over 35 years, working on more than 10,000 green certified projects in Florida. He's a NGBS master verifier, a certified Green Globes professional, FGBC certifying agent, a lead accredited professional and a homes field verifier, a certified commissioning authority, a Florida governor appointment as green building commissioner, F uh, Florida Building Commission Energy Technical Advisory and a, a lot of other things, which I <laughs> um, have put too much on here. So, 
I'm really happy to introduce uh, Drew Smith, who has been very helpful to me as I was preparing this, and, and thank you very much for joining us. Please welcome. All right. Thank you, Kent. Thank you, everyone. Okay. So the, uh, the NGBS program, uh, NGBS Green, or the National Green Building Standard uh, is program, uh, very similar to the Florida Green program. Uh, the major difference is it's a national program. Uh, it was uh, founded uh, probably about about 15 years ago now. Uh, originally, it started out uh, through the Home Innovation Research Labs, which was founded in 1964 uh, as more of a research lab to to help uh, residential construction builders, architects, and product development, and really just looking at products and how products are made and put together to be a more sustainable product. And from that, uh, research lab grew into market research, product testing, applied building science research, uh, standards development, and then moved into also the third party uh, certification, which we ended up becoming the NGBS program. The NGBS program uh, is an above code standard. It's, na it's national. Uh, Similar to the other programs, uh, it uh, follows uh, the guidelines of uh, this pr program particular in particular files the ICC 700 uh, guidelines. It's for all residential uh, structures anywhere from one story to a hundred stories. So it's it is strictly set up for residential with a component for. Uh, commercial with regard to uh, mixed use multifamily projects that have part of the building set up as a multifamily uh, with with stores or restaurants on the first floor or a or a component thereof. Uh, it's totally a voluntary program. Uh, we see it being used uh, primarily uh, across the country in both the residential sector, not only for uh, the multifamily market, which seems to be the most prevalent for the NGBS program because it falls very nicely into the um, HUD requirements on multifamily projects, but also it, it uh, works very well in the um, track or production builder type scenario as well. Uh, the program, what makes it different, it's, as, as I spoke, it's a national program, very comprehensive uh, practices for design, construction, verification, and operation. Uh, it's written in code language. It has very few mandatory provisions, expansive, uh, flexible point system that allows the builder or homeowner to choose a lot of different variations of how they can achieve their points. So the, the flexibility there is a huge shopping list of um, components that can uh, allow a builder to focus more on energy, more on water, more on sustainable indoor products, and still achieve some type of certification. Uh, it true. also includes a tropical climate zone provision the third party verification, very important part of, of the NGBS program. It, uh, it's third party, like uh, Dr. Lenguel had mentioned, very similar to the, to the uh, FGBC program with regard to having multiple site visits, having a verifier that works with the builder or homeowner during the design process all the way through the construction process with a, a mandatory pre-drywall inspection where we want to see what's behind the walls before the uh, drywall is installed to make sure the right insula insulation is installed, that the quality of the insulation installation is correct, that the correct windows are installed, they're sealed and installed correctly, that the air conditioning system is installed correctly. Uh, we're looking at everything that you would not be able to see once the drywall is up, and that is that is a mandatory inspection for the uh, NGBS program. Then throughout the construction process, we're there working with the builder or the, the homeowner to uh, 
go through their choices, their, their design choices, going through their fixture selections and adding or subtracting points throughout the checklist as, as the design or as the home uh, goes through the construction process. And then the most important is our final inspection. Uh, very similar to the other programs, we, we come out, we do a complete uh, review of the checklist and all of the points that are being captured. We're going to do as well a blower door test uh, for a single family and also any multifamily three stories and under uh, as part of the program to be able to not only allow to garner additional points on the checklist for that, but uh, most of the verifiers are also doing it as a, a added value by giving it a, the home or the project, the HERS index, uh, typically on the single family uh, projects as far as the uh, HERS index. We want to be able to give that added value back to the, uh, to the homeowner uh, for, for future reference. There, there's always audits. Um, the verifiers uh, conf uh, confirm the building conformance. Uh, the, the important part is for a verification standpoint, we're looking at the project, but then all of our data is turned into the Home Innovations Research Lab where they do a complete audit of our field inspection work. And then the certification is issued through Home Innovations Research Lab and then provided back to the builder or through us, through the builder, as, as a verifier to the builder for their final uh, documentation. So everything that goes into the program is uh, very uh, critically reviewed and for stringency and, and accuracy to make sure that what really was built and what's in the project actually really did go into the project. Uh, the, the NGBS program has nearly 350,000 certified homes and apartments nationally. There's kind of some of the stats right now of projects that have been certified as well as in process. The activity of NGBS in Florida has uh, been pretty active over the past few years uh, with Florida taking on the number two spot uh, overall in the nation uh, with uh, 1,123 single family homes and 1,459 buildings representing about 65,000 or 64,000 uh, uh, dwelling units uh, on the uh, multifamily side. The categories, similar to what uh, Dr. Linguel mentioned, the, the FG, uh, NGBS program has very similar categories with the exception of it not having a specifically focused um, durability uh, disaster mitigation type category because this is a more well-rounded program for is set up for the entire nation. It it does have lot design development, uh, which also incorporates all of the uh, zero uh, the Florida friendly landscaping, uh, that, uh, drought tolerant plants, resource efficiency, energy efficiency, water efficiency, your indoor in air quality and indoor environment as well as operations and maintenance, which we want to make sure that the building not only performs when it's tested and inspected, but also uh, as it uh, goes through its entire life. Uh, a little bit about how the points are divided up, uh, similar to all the other programs as four different levels, and the point stringency and, and rigorousness is increased as the certification level increases. Uh, certification costs. Certification on, on NGBS as, as well as any of the other programs can be, can be zero. If, if you're just building just above code minimum, really as far as construction costs, it can go from zero to any percentage to, depending on where you want to end up with the program. But to get, to hit a bronze level or the lowest level certification, um, it can be very little dollars, uh, and as Jennifer had said, probably less than five thousand dollars. Sometimes we we find a lot of our projects hit hit the lowest level of certification with no additional cost, just because that's what the builder wants to do. The verification for the verifier 
in the process that that is a range that is really negotiated from builder to builder and, and verifier to verifier so it's really hard to put a, a real number on that but the certification fees uh the registration is no charge and the certification fees range anywhere from uh 300 to a thousand dollars per building and 30 dollars per unit on a multifamily and a single family home uh, is 200 dollars per home and to kind of wrap it up ngb and ngbs is is really easy uh, this is just a sampling of a of a production builder just above code built house and they're hitting in the silver range and that is on a daily ongoing basis uh, that we see. So it, it's very, very easy to achieve a green certification with very little cost and very little effort on the builder's part as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Drew. And uh, we're going to move to the Q&A session. So at this point, open it up to questions that, that you have. Um, focus mainly on FGBC and NGBS, uh, the, the processes, the, the cost, projects that, that have been certified, uh, really anything in that area. Um, I have a question for either Drew or, or Jennifer. Um, in regards to incentives by smaller size cities, Delray Beach is like 100,000 people, Similar size cities, what type of incentives in your experience are our cities putting forth to encourage uh, builders, uh, developers to utilize uh, green building certification? Uh, I know the programs are relatively modest in pricing, but there are a lot of soft costs in terms of testing and inventory modeling and all that, depending on what level you get to. So just wondering what your experience are, what other any cities are offering, you know. Partial tax abatements or refunds of permit fees or reductions of impact fees, that kind of stuff. Yeah, or even maybe more modest programs in there. Just interested in your feedback. Well, I I can I can jump in and start with the some of the some of the counties that I'm familiar with. Um, many offer accelerated uh, permitting processing, which in some cases can be a pretty big incentive depending on how far of a backlog of permits there might be out there. Uh, other counties are offering a small, maybe a 10% rebate on, on uh, permit fees for producing a green certification. It really depends on, on the municipality. We've, we've, everyone is a little bit different, but those are the primary things that we're seeing. Jennifer, if you want to add anything. So we've, we've seen the same, basically the Sometimes a rebate, sometimes a fast track permit. We have never to date that I'm aware of seen uh, impact fee reduction. Um, just the, the local governments aren't, they use that money. Um, so they're not, I don't think, willing to, to let that loose. Um, we also do see some of these other programs like 40 Yards and Neighborhoods where it's a free program. So um, use your, your extension agencies as well um, but did the incentives always cover the whole cost? Not necessarily. I know at one point Sarasota County was giving a thousand dollar rebate, which really did cover the whole uh, soft cost. So it also depends on the funding the local government may happen to have at the time. Yeah, I encourage you to, when you get home, go to homeinnovation.com slash NGBS green incentives. There we have a complete list of all the incentives that we're aware of for NGBS green certification, and you'll see that there's many for Florida locations. Okay. Other questions? I know there's plenty of questions, so don't be shy. We'll, we'll give you pretty direct answers too. I have to say today, and I was in an OAC meeting and someone said, well, what height do you want that installed? And my response was boob height. <laughs> they were like, what is that? I said about 48 inches. It really depends on the person. So, you know, we may not be PC at all, but we'll definitely give you direct answers. 
Andrew looks like he had a question. He always said, oh, I'm just thinking about it. No, I, I, I think it, it comes down to how we want to implement what program and how, you know, or what type of buildings we're going to decide. I think that's going to be the focus of what we're trying to establish because you know, we're, we're already, uh, we have the option of going to be for for program for uh, one of the projects we have, and we're already caught, we're always saying that yeah, we're going to pull it and rebuild. We don't want to be, okay? Uh, especially if we have to be gold right now, we're going to be program. We rarely pull it and rebuild a lot of families, so we don't have an issue with that. Uh, but again, yeah, there's different buildings out there, and uh, we're, you know, we're we got to establish in our mind what's the city want and what we're looking for. So is it going to be city wide? Is it going to be for homes? Everything or what? You know, uh, and costs associated with not only the building but the homeowners too. Uh, the city right now, the new homes in the city are, are, are not that much. Usually it's teardowns. And they're going to build a bigger home. Most of the people are carrying down homes or an area where they're going to build a bigger home, and they can afford to do some of the energy saving devices like solar or you know natural gas, uh, water heaters, etc. And, and they're pretty savvy; they can do that. But a standard home, you know, owner here, we don't have that many. I mean. Most of the homes, I know Roger does homes all the time. You're doing what, 5,000 to 10,000 range or even higher? Out of any policy, nothing more than 4,999. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> because you don't want to hire us engineers. <laughs> I charge you the 5,000. There you go. But, uh, but that's what we're trying to establish here. And then one program we're going to open it for. Yeah. Well, and that. I, I, I don't want to get too far into that because it assumes that we're going to have an, an ordinance that actually requires meeting a certification level for some kind of a program. And I mean, I've heard loud and clear. Um, and I am concerned about being you know, a part of pushing an ordinance that really was not accepted by the development community because it's not going to work. I mean, we, we need to have an ordinance that moves Delray forward. In my closing, I, I got some, some comments on that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, right now, I really want to focus on the, there are alternative pro programs to lead. Right. And, and, and we know those, but we, we've worked with uh, the other programs, Green Globes, we've worked with Florida Green Bill, we've worked with Lee, uh, oh, all of them. I recommend not going with LEED right now. And a lot of our projects that we're doing that are LEED certified now, LEED in principle are municipal buildings, but they're not going to be, they're not doing the paperwork. They're doing it, you know, formal process. The formal process. Let's ask about that um, because it, it does lead into a certain kind of, of ordinance design um, for, for the panel. Uh, as far as if an ordinance required um, going through the documentation process, filling out a checklist that would meet uh, one of the systems, but not formally going through and obtaining the, the certification from that green building program. Does that have value? And what, I mean, have you seen um, some of those? Instances? So what what we have seen is that if you say build to versus certify, you're not going to get anything because it's all going to get VE'd out by the contractor. So you, you've got to hold them to it if you really want that out of it. Now, third party certification may not be the end all be all, right? You may just say what we care about is energy and water and come up with something different than third party certification but then you as a local government have to manage that so the the benefit of a third party program is that 
I don't want to say you're passing the buck, but you don't bear the burden of, of proof, so to speak. So we just, every built to is not certifiable. That's yeah. my experience. Yeah, so, I think there, there's real benefit to that on-site verification. Folks like Drew and Jennifer going out to the site and checking up on every single feature of the building. And then their documents come to our team and we review each and every item and identify any potential issues. So you're getting, you know, their stamp of approval, but also that third party review from Home Innovation or from FGBC. And you get more marketing value. If you as a builder or developer are getting a third party certification, that's more, it's going to make you more competitive in the long run, um, both within Delray Beach and outside of it, if you are getting that third party certification and marketing it. Okay. And the only other thing that I might say, Drew, you might have experienced this, is I tell everyone all the time, we're not the green police, right? We, right. We're here to help you because I have found bath fans that are hardwired that the contractor missed. I have found walls that were supposed to be insulated that they were starting to put drywall up on that didn't have insulation. Right. We are another set of eyes doing QA, QC for you. We're trying to make your jobs better, not be, you know, a hard ass about green things and, and ruin your lives. Right. That's not what we're trying to do. No, I, I agree. We're there to help. We're we're part of the team. We're part of the build team, really. And we're, we're, we're as Jennifer said, we're not the police, but we are there to help make sure that the contractor building the project is giving you what you paid for. Right. So, so the other question I have, at the end of the process, you have a building that gets certified. You get your, you get your plaque. How long is that certification good for? As long as the project stays the way it is, the certification lasts on with these two programs. So, so a year afterwards, I don't even know two years afterward. Does anyone go back to recheck these buildings? It's not a requirement. Yeah, with the vertical construction, no. With other types of certifications, yes. And I, I get what you're saying, right? We're we're certifying at a sliver of time, and the homeowner could come in and pull restrictor valves out and put non-drought tolerant vegetation and. Yeah, so that's where I'm going with this. We we. We, you know, and we, we get called upon sometimes is trying to figure out why a, a, the gold building is using more energy per se than a non certified anything green building of the comparable size. Okay. We go to do our analysis, we find that everything that was put in for the making a building the gold or whatever certification has been bypassed. And now you, of course, mentioned Florida with ventilation. You're bringing in all this untreated air, so you have to more, do more air conditioning. Hence, your power bills go up to keep it cool and everything like that. So, you know, I, I don't have a problem. I, I guess what I'm having a problem with is that you're going for all this trouble to certify a building. And like you said, deliver and die. At the end of the project, you get certified. When we get down the road and they start hiring building engineers, depending on how, you know, site, not a home, but, you know, of our bigger projects, everything goes out the window. So where do we stand with that? And that's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. There's so a, no a big piece there. of this is education, right? The, the human element is what you're talking about, right? We fiddle. We go in and we fiddle with this thermostat on the wall that really doesn't do anything other than give me two degrees plus or minus, right? But I'm gonna fiddle with it. There's a lighting control panel and a conference room. I'm gonna fiddle with it because that's what we do. So without the education piece, you know, we're, we're lost. We have to have that education component. And if you're going to spend that money on a building and not train the homeowner or not train the facility manager, no, you're not going to get the value out of it. It's a lost value. Yeah, but you see what I'm, where I'm going with it. Now, we have buildings that we do 
small count. And I'll say for city owned buildings, they probably would have a program in place to keep them in some reasonable form of a certification. But a lot of our buildings at the end of the day are sold within 30 days of getting their CO. And it goes to somebody else, to a, a venture group. And I'm talking about multiple families or you know, something big, okay? And that's where, I, you know, we, it's a disconnect at that point because the original owner knew all about this, they'll tell the person, and hey, we got you a, a, a certified building here. Here it is. It, it falls on the other people to keep it certified, but we all know what happened after that. And that's where, you know, we spent all this money up front. The original developer, he'll make his money back by sitting on the building. But in essence, within a year or two, it falls out of certification because they don't keep up with the right maintenance on the thing. So I will say that if you have that green certification at time of sale, the building is going to be much more competitive. We get calls all the time from developers that are about to sell a building and the investor doesn't want it because it's not green certified and they're already done with construction. They've already got C of O, so we're kind of out of luck. So it's better to do it at time of construction, so get it under your belt, and then you have it to make the building more competitive at sale because investors are looking for it. Well, and so I would also say just thank you for that comment because that, from an organizational standpoint, that's something we need to address, right? So NGBS, FGBC as an organization should really look at that as that is a, a problem that we need to, to look into solving. I absolutely agree with the investor side. I mean, I've dealt with Prudential, JP Morgan, Bearings. They all have environmental sustainability goals. They all require that anything in their portfolio is certified. So if you're doing multifamily or bigger buildings, you're going to live in that world. Single family, you, you may not live in that world. Well, and also there, there is a trend coming as far as uh, data mining for green building certifications. And so there's there's a site right now, the Green Building Registry. If you go on the Green Building Registry, you'll if you look up Delray Beach, Florida, you'll see every single uh, uh, certified property. It, it lead NGBS, FGBC, um, and what what's coming out of that is we're actually going to start um, the database of the green features that evolved with that project. So if you've gone away from painting your house, or if you've gone away from using um, low impact development techniques on the home. That's something that can be seen in that database because when you got certified, you had that. Um, and so as these properties are becoming um, more and more recognized in a database format, it's going to be harder and harder to make those changes to the certification. And, and I think recert, recertification is coming down the road in some aspect. And we've been called into the homes that we've done by the seller or by the buyer on a resale and had to go back through the checklist and verify that it was still certifiable, so to speak, that they that it still met the points that were there when it was originally certified. Uh, one of your neighboring areas, uh, we're doing, we did a project in Boynton Beach that a um, little different. Kent, don't hit me with this one when I tell you about this, but they had a program where they, they actually incentivize the apartment complex to be green and do a very energy efficient project. And for the, they gave a certain percentage of the money back to developer over a 10 year period of time. So they calculated what the total energy costs or total certification costs were going to be to upgrade to the program. And over the next 10 years, we go out there and do an audit over over 10% of the apartment units to make sure they're still in compliance. We're in, on year number nine right now. And so every year the city of Boynton Beach writes a check back to the developer for 10% of the total cost that they encumbered for the entire energy savings on the project. It's a way that the city ensured that they're going to stay in compliance. And yeah, we have to do a HERS index test on 10% of the units every year, and we inspect for NGBS on 10% of the units every year to make sure that they still meet the checklist. I and mean, that's that's one way that we've found a municipality that actually does, we had the same type of concern about falling out of green, so to speak, 
and they they ab absolutely have to walk the walk. Another way that I have thought of, and again, this is this is assuming that, that we have an ordinance that goes along with, but something much similar and, and cheaper because we're going to have a record of the green building certification and we'll have a record. We want to promote that on the board of child. We can have an education program. It goes out to the owners of those buildings. This is the program that you were certified under. These are the things that are within your home, even the permitting documents, those are, are public record. So, you know, it's not as strong certainly as having a certifier that it goes out to the site, but it is something that would be relatively easy to incorporate and in, in lower cost from an education standpoint. So I think back to how your ordinance is going to work, especially for individual homeowners. It, it will. And I mean, we, we have talked about the, the square footage and I mean, I have learned more. I've learned a lot during this whole process, but, but now I'm more in the realm of 15 to 20,000 square foot. A lot of different reasons. Um, I mean, it is going to reduce the, the numbers that we're dealing with, certainly on the front end of things, but it will keep all of those different types of development in, in the realm will allow the ordinance to be revised. In the future, easily, if, if you know, things run properly, keep all the different sectors of, of development involved there. And I don't mean to say this lightly because everybody's money is important and it's important to me. But all that have money to put into either development, commercial development, larger homes, multi family. They're going, to, they're going to see the benefit and understand the benefit that, that comes out of these kinds of systems too. So I think now I'm really on board and I have been more in, in the 10,000 square foot range, but I think 15 to 20,000 more of the community is going to support um, and for other reasons to get it implemented for follow up, for training, for verification. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why to go to that square footage. And the, um, and unfortunately, I don't think it has to do with the panel here. I, I think one of my biggest fears is you, you say it perfectly, like if it does run smoothly, if it does go the way you guys envision it, problem right now, the biggest issue, and it's nothing against staff or the city, nothing is going fast right now. Um, you guys do not have enough employees. We are overloaded with development in Delray. Uh, the projects are stacking up. Uh, we don't have enough staff now. We don't have enough board meetings. So now you're down to one time a month at a board meeting. Uh, the boards are overloaded. It's like, so when I start looking at something like this as another layer of something that we have to do, uh, I'm not saying I don't want to do it, but I am telling you, it's getting extremely difficult to get anything happen right now. And so I'm just worried as we start adding more and more. Again, if we talk about these clients, yeah, our clients. I'm very quick my clients have a lot of money, but they have money because they made money and it's based on time. And right now, the amount of months that say you get a permit, and I, I'm not bragging about our set of drawings, but our drawings are pretty decent. We still cannot get permits quickly. Uh, it's just we really have inexperienced staff looking at stuff right now. Um, we have new staff. Uh, we're losing a lot of the institutional knowledge that we had. So it's, I don't know whether you want to call it growing pains or what, but you know, it's something that the city has to address um, and somehow figure it out because I know staff has to be frustrated. There's no way it's got to be easy, no more work, and they got a pile of stuff that they can through. So that's my only worry about as we add more to this. How do we get this to be smooth? That's all I thought I'm for. And, and it does need to be. And Gary, thank you. Jeff, Jeff uh, the assistant city manager, is here and appreciate him, him being here to hear those kinds of things because th this really was designed to hit two, I mean, two major areas you know, difficulty in getting through the process and cost of getting through the process. But there are other, there are other hurdles. And what I'm really hoping is that the, you know, the fear of lead, difficulty of the green building certification can be addressed. And we'll see. You know, can we can we design something? Is there a time frame that we go? Maybe for the maybe there's a year's lead time you know, before it starts. Maybe in that first year it is uh, a submittal of, of a checklist. 
and so the staff can can see that the actual certification is required. And, and there's other things that, that we can do too. Um, okay, so we're, I mean, it's, I think y'all that have talked to me see, and that's why I gave my background too. I had staff. We had you know close to 10,000 applications. Done. They were all these different programs. I had staff turnover in them. I designed ways of training the staff so they'd be up and running and long, doing the easy stuff. Check off. But every little thing that you add on can, can be involved. You need to be sure and certain, and I'm, I'm committed to that. I mean, I want an ordinance. I think it's good mm -hmm. for Delray, but it's got to be done the right way. I have a question for Drew. Drew, have you found uh, your recently material shortage impacting the certification on your buildings? And we don't know how long this is going to last, but all, all indication is we're going to be into this shortage of all sorts of material for the next couple of years, I see. Um, material uh, shortages really haven't affected the it slowed down the whole process of building, but it really hasn't changed or affected the certification process. You know, there may be uh, an item or two, such as the client was going for a metal roof and decided to go for shingles because they were readily available, but very little. We're seeing more of a slowdown in construction than anything. I've just been noticing it the past few weeks where things have just all of a sudden really is starting to catch up with the supply chain issues, but really hasn't affected the uh, certification process at all. I think the one example that I see is that some places aren't getting their windows until really late in the game, like very close to the end of construction. So that just means that the timing is screwed up a little bit where someone might be having to come back a second time to check out some of those rough verification items, but it's not an insurmountable hurdle. There's so many things to choose from. You're not able to get a few items from a small set of credit. There's plenty Appli of things. appliances may be the, the biggest thing. Uh, you know, on, on final, there may not be appliances, all the appliances to get all the credits for the HERS index or the energy side of it because they're not on site. So we either have to hold the certification until they actually show up or they just they don't get the credits for those energy star appliances so the, but very very little has really affected the the certification i i just want to i heard you mention about the insurance before i want to see are insurance companies giving more incentives for it it, it seems like that would be the best to get people to recertify Every year, every couple of years, is through insurance incentive. The insurance incentive I mentioned was specific to the Fortified program because that program specifically addresses things like nail pattern distances. You know, it, it's designed for durability, so to speak, and it's driven by the Insurance Institute. Um, the green building programs, because there's so many options and i think that's also why we don't see a, a necessary slowdown because of green building is there's a thousand different ways to put a package together right so mm -hmm. these organizations aren't offering necessarily discounts because we're not sure what points you're choosing off the bat right everyone's choosing different things where if you're doing something like fortified right you're specifically addressing that durability issue which is why they're giving you discounts Okay, but not in general, just for building green, they're not because I mean, when you do start to build green, right? You're, you're fortifying more, as you're saying, in general, your home's becoming more energy efficient, your you know, property values are getting better, but they're not doing anything really outside of the fortified program. We, we don't see the insurance institutes doing anything different there. Um, we and I just pulled up the the database CJ you were talking about and it's it's pretty impressive. I mean it's pretty up to date. Um, so if you have someone looking to buy a home and they can it's that easy to click on a house and know what the HERS score is, what certification that house has, uh, you know I mean it, it's it's pretty real time 
the incentives, you know, for us, we always have to say are really the value that you're giving to your client. We see discounts on certain green items or certain, we, I see it, uh, if you're doing an all steel house with ICFs and you're using, you know, a light deck concrete for your floors. Yes, I've seen that homeowner get a substantial discount on their insurance. And those are green items and you're gonna capture green points for it, but that's not the entire green certification that's giving you that discount. It's the method of construction. That's a really interesting point though, because if insurance companies could, could be more involved with safety, you know, and, and certainly the, the, the ruggedness of the construction is part of safety, but there's other safety issues too that also lead to, to green. Well, it made sense with the durability factor that's in the Florida Green Building Code. Right, I mean, that's yeah. a yeah. other, so, but, but other kinds of safety issues that, that come to mind too, that, that would have crossover. I mean, that, that's a new thought to me I haven't thought about. But where insurance goes, um, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> you don't even sure they're supposed to insure. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Other questions? I mean, we're we're getting close to the eight o'clock hour. Um, really appreciate that the panel um, being here. We want to be sure to, to cover all the questions that we have. I have a question. It might be simple and I can, <clears throat> excuse me, I might be a little behind the curve here, but like if you have a multifamily and it's certified through, say, a third party or the FGBC, um, when getting a permit to do like a reno on, on a condo, on a unit, kind of how does that process work? You you broke up right when you. Yeah, I didn't said, understand the last part. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, um, like if you're doing a renovation on a unit that's in the complex, how do you go about like the permitting process? Like how's that different? So if it's an existing building and you're just going in, you know, after the fact and you're renovating, you know, a given unit, there's not going to be anything involved in the green building area. Again, our certification would go back to that building was CO'd at a certain point in time. That's when it achieved its certification. So this goes back to the argument of, you know, why aren't we checking through time? Um, if it's multifamily and you did something strange to one unit, you know, you probably aren't jeopardizing the whole building certification anyway. Um, now, if you went and gutted every unit and you know did some horrible energy stuff, we'd probably get mad, but we would probably never know. So um, as this is new to me for the ordinance that we drafted, uh, I mean, my, my opinion was that we don't address renovations just because if there's an existing building, it's being reduced. I mean, there, there certainly is a downside there with energy efficiency and, and, and that kind of thing, but it, it already is a certain kind of green building. But I thought that there were programs for renovation uh, that that address them and why would those not apply to an individual unit if, if there are programs yeah so the ngbs has an existing buildings pathway that's really flexible um there's a prescriptive path which is more appealing for n newer buildings and then there's a performance path as well for achieving energy and water savings and it's based on you know a before and after so if it's an existing building that's been you know built in the 1950s or 60s 70s it's going to be really easy to achieve that minimum 15 percent energy savings 20 percent water savings um because the building is existing and already so inefficient compared to new construction today um and we don't care how you get to that savings it's you know whatever changes you're able to make so if it's adding aerators and changing out the toilets to get that water savings great you know um drew do you want to build on that at all um yeah that that program is really very flexible and yeah it can like uh, cindy said it can really adapt to pretty much any 
any type of building in any age, but as the building gets newer and newer and more, more to the newer codes, it becomes a little more difficult to achieve that certification because you can't get over that threshold of the 50% energy savings because it may or may already be uh, very energy efficient. For instance, if there, if the if the project you're trying to renovate has 1.6 gallon per flush toilets in it, then you're not going to be able to capture the water savings you need to get over that threshold for certification. So, I mean, I, again, that, that's a good question. I, I think right now, um, and, and I want the best ordinance that we can get, but exactly what that is, I, that's why I'm looking at renovation and saying that would be a mixed space kind of thing. Once we already have the, the community and the knowledge of the systems and the comfort level and it's working and the timing and the workload and all of those kinds of things, then we look, look and see. And I do. I justify that by saying renovation of existing buildings are by, by nature. They are a kind of reuse and, and they're green. And a lot of times you're going to get these kinds of savings you know, automatically. And that that. I had two other things that I wanted to uh, address, and I don't think we need time to address either either one of them. I mean, both of them together. But uh, first of all, Florida Building Code is is changing, and a lot of the the grant and funding uh, programs, uh, banks, loans are going towards um, requiring this kind of, of certification. So, just a, a question about. Um, you know, the, the wisdom of going ahead and making the step to require this. And is it a good thing for, for the city marketability um, in addition to the preparation for, for resilience? Since it, it seems like it's almost going to be a requirement in the near future. There's, um, there's the code is constantly going to improve. There's, it's going to get more stringent as time goes on. So the sooner my recommendation is the sooner that the municipalities get on board and have some type of program uh, even at the most minuscule level you're going to make it that much simpler for the building community to be able to participate and actually be at code or above code as the code continually increases i worked with a group of folks in georgia when the state of Georgia was considering changes to their green building requirements for affordable housing. And we worked with a couple companies very similar to what Jennifer and Drew do. And they looked at errors that they found when they went out to do green building verifications. And a lot of the errors that they caught and addressed were co-compliance issues that might not have been identified had they not been coming out in their role as a green verifier to check up on all aspects of the building. So just because something's code doesn't mean that it's always being implemented correctly 100% of the time and that there's real quality assurance benefits from a third party certification. And then Kent, just to your point, uh, if, if you are building affordable housing using Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac funds, you are required to certify. Okay, and, and the, uh, Last question is if you could just mention um, best examples that you have of, of market driven kind of development where um, there's increased demand or higher rents or health benefits, resale costs uh, associated with, with some of the projects that y'all have been working on, the real um, you know, financial success stories. I mean, I'd say it's a little tough right now because everything is so crazy price wise. I mean, I'm, you know, we Drew works a lot in Lakewood Ranch, which is an entire sustainable community. I work a lot in Babcock Ranch, which is an entire sustainable community. And I don't think, you know, we've I, I can't, don't even know the number we've sold. We've sold in the hundreds of houses already this year. Right. So. These, these green buildings are selling people, especially with gas prices now, you know, look at that energy efficiency and say, huh, you know, I guess it's a good thing. 
assuming it just comes with the house, right? They don't, they won't want it as a package. They just want it integrated into the design. That's what we've seen for sure. Um, but you can track some of these communities. The realtors are another very aggressive group from a standpoint of they understand the value, um, especially if they're comparing a new build to an existing home to talk to a homeowner about the energy efficiency a new home will have inherently because of those code improvements as compared to an existing home. So we see the realtors a lot pushing kind of the, the sales side of it, making sure the appraisers are incorporating the green building features into their numbers. So that's where we see it happening in the field. And also, um, as Jennifer mentioned, Lakewood Ranch and Babcock Ranch are two of the fastest selling communities in the country right now. And they both all have uh, certified uh, homes within the properties or the communities. Um, what we're also finding is retirement homes is a huge, huge driver for certifications. You have folks living on fixed incomes. If you can lower their water and their energy bills month to month and, and ensure that they're not going to go up, it makes it a win-win for the developer and for the, the residents. You have waiting lists of residents trying to get into green retirement homes. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Um, any other questions, anybody? <clears throat> All right, well, really appreciate the, the panel. Um, I mean, I was excited as we were preparing for, for tonight. Sorry for the, the technical difficulties. Uh, I'll take a look at the, at the video, though, and um, maybe even ask you to, to redo parts of that, and we can, we can clip it together. But really appreciate uh, your time to tonight. Thank you guys.